First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the Ngunnawal people, their elders past, present and emerging of the lands on which we meet. I'd like to acknowledge the tent embassy and the elders of the over 500 different nations which make up what we now call Australia. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and some of our supporters who've made it along today. Today, I want to talk about the fight for our future. But we cannot fight for the future until we come to terms with our past. This country was invaded. Sovereignty was never ceded. First Nations people were violently dispossessed. Lands, waters and children have been stolen. Families broken and communities torn apart. Successive governments have perpetrated grave injustices, dispossession and imprisonment since colonisation, which continues to this day. Hundreds of First Nations people have died in police custody and no one has been held to account. Kids as young as 10 can be thrown in jail. And in the Northern Territory, 100% of the kids in prison are Indigenous. We must begin to tell the truth to start to heal as we begin our journey towards a treaty or treaties with our First Nations peoples. A treaty will create a unified national identity that celebrates what unites us, protects the rights of First Nations people and their cultures, while also acknowledging the ongoing and historical injustices of colonisation. And I want to pay tribute to the work of our First Nations Senators Lydia Thorpe and Dorinda Cox, who have been working so hard to put a treaty and justice for First Nations people on the national agenda and acknowledge how proud I am to be part of a party room that is not only a majority women, but that has 20% two out of 10 First Nations women. I have a picture, I have a picture of a coal-fired power station hanging on the wall of my office. It was a gift from La Trobe Valley Power Station workers from before I entered Parliament, thanking me for representing them after I fought to protect their wages and conditions after privatisation. In the last few months, I've visited Rockhampton, Gladstone, Townsville, Newcastle and Singleton with a simple message. We have to get out of coal and gas while supporting coal and gas workers. I've assured these communities that coal and gas workers are not the enemy. We are all in this together. My message to coal and gas workers is simple. Thank you. You have helped build this country. You have done dangerous jobs and fought hard for secure work with good wages, and we respect the incredible contribution that you've made to this country. The Greens' $19 billion job for job guarantee that preserves coal workers' wages at current rates for 10 years as we phase out the industry and grow new businesses to take coal's place has been very well received. In many places, the best job for a coal worker is another mining job. And so we, the Greens, back to growing green mineral sector in Australia, where we mine and process here the metals and minerals that we need to make batteries, electric cars, wind turbines and other products to sell to a zero pollution world. People aren't stupid. We can all see the writing on the wall. We want a future for our kids. The Greens will tell working people the truth and we will not abandon them. Because telling the truth is more important now than ever. And the truth is, we're at war. People are being chased from their homes by floods and fires. Our enemy is the climate crisis. The enemy is fuelled by coal and gas. Mining and burning coal and gas is killing people. And Liberal and Labor want more. The war is bleaching our reef, burning our forests to the ground, dropping rain bombs on our cities and towns, damaging our communities and our economy. Last month, I was in the flood hit areas of Brisbane and Lismore. It was like a war zone. Floods had ripped through the towns, uprooting people from their homes. And this war isn't happening in 2030 or 2050, it is happening now. Liberal and Labor talk of a policy of appeasement, but their weak 2030 targets will cook our country by more than three degrees. Liberal and Labor haven't just given up, they are aiding the enemy by backing more coal and gas. Liberal and Labor are backing 114 new coal and gas projects around the country. And today, the Labor leader confirmed that Labor won't stop new coal mines. Just let that sink in for a moment. When everyone, 
from the world scientists to the United Nations and even the Conservative International Energy Agency, all say that to reach even the inadequate net zero by 2050 goals, there can be no new fossil fuel projects. None, Liberal and Labor, back 114 new fossil fuel projects. I don't know how Liberal and Labor can look at towns like Cabago, Mallacoota, Lismore or Ballina in the eye and tell them that opening a new coal and gas mine is a good idea. They have blood on their hands. They have the blood of the people who were trapped in their flooded homes or burned to death trying to run away from a raging bushfire. This year, this financial year, Liberal and Labor governments around the country are handing out $11.6 billion worth of subsidies to the coal, oil and gas industry, a massive 12 per cent increase on last year's figure and 56 times the budget of the National Recovery and Resilience Agency. The most recent budget takes $350 million of your money, of public money, and gives it to gas pipeline studies and the fracking of the gas in the Beetaloo Basin, with billions more for new gas terminals in Darwin, all to benefit fossil fuel corporations. Then there's the Beetaloo Basin, driven by the Labor government in the Northern Territory, a project so big that it will lift Australia's own emissions by up to 13% rejected by the traditional owners, opposed by the majority of Australians, yet received $226 million so far in taxpayer handouts from Liberal and Labor. Then there's Labor's Scarborough gas project in Western Australia, the only state where emissions keep going up. It's one of the world's most dangerous projects. Then there's Labor's plan to, in Victoria to mine for gas and oil around the Twelve Apostles opening the pristine Southern Ocean to oil spills and industrialisation. The Prime Minister said, this is coal, don't be afraid. We're not afraid, we're angry. We're angry that you're consigning us to what you admitted, Prime Minister, is a much harder country to live in. We have to stop arming the enemy. If these projects go ahead, we will be locking in decades of damage to our country. These projects alone will ensure that all climate targets will be missed. We will cook, we will be washed away, we will starve and we will die. You can't put the fire out while pouring more petrol on it. So you will hear the Greens continue to deliver a simple message between now and election day. No more coal and gas. When we're in balance of power after the election in the Senate, and the House and have kicked the Liberals out, this will be our key demand. In this time of climate and environmental emergency, stop opening coal and gas mines. Now, commentators are saying that this election will be very close. And major media outlets are now routinely quoting Liberal and Labor Party insiders saying a minority parliament is likely. But whatever happens in the lower house, the Greens will be in balance of power in the Senate, potentially in our own right. We're being upfront about what we'll put on the table and push for in the next parliament. The Greens will kick the Liberals out and take climate action by stopping new coal and gas mines, and will tackle the cost of living by getting dental and mental health into Medicare, fixing the housing affordability crisis and wiping student debt. I've been saying these things for almost two years, and I say them again today because the Greens are now poised to be the most powerful third party in the parliament after the election. We've just had a record vote in the South Australian election. We were the only party in parliament whose vote grew in the Tasmanian election. We've doubled our seats in that bastion of democracy, the Queensland parliament, and we've tripled our seats here in the ACT. We are fighting, we are growing, and we are winning. We aren't worried about the climate independents, we welcome them. They are drawing attention to the climate inaction of Liberal and Labor. The more climate is in the news, the better, and it makes a power-sharing parliament more likely. Tasmania and South Australia both saw the Greens vote rise, even as independents gained votes and seats. And aside from the Liberal Greens seat of Kuyong, where an independent and the Greens are queuing up to unseat Josh Frydenberg, there isn't any seat around the country where the Greens and the Independents are competing. Our support is rising because the Greens are fighting for everyone's future. We will be in both Houses of Parliament 
with stronger leverage, able to affect more change, and will kick the Liberals out. We are hopeful of increasing our numbers in the lower house, and we have some incredible local candidates around the country. In Griffith, in Brisbane, Max Chandler Mather's campaign has had over 20,000 one-on-one conversations. And in my view, he's on track to win a tough campaign. His campaign is, every time I go up there, is determined to point out that the 20,000 one-on-one conversations they've had is twice the number that my campaign for Melbourne in 2010 <laughs> achieved. Elizabeth Watson-Brown, in the Liberal seat of Ryan, also has her nose in front at the moment. The Greens hold the state seat of Maywa that sits inside Ryan, achieved with a primary vote of above 40% and a massive 14% swing away from the Liberals at the last state election. And keep an eye on Stephen Bates in Brisbane too. We could also win in Richmond, the seat in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales, where activist, writer and well-known stand-up comedian Mandy Nolan is a local champion who has been helping her community fight for survival since the devastating floods. Her very Northern Rivers campaign features a picture of her in a bikini riding a giant prawn, and <laughs> she doesn't take a backward step. We would all be better off for having someone who can tell it straight like Mandy in this place. In Victoria, we think we could win in McNamara, where Steph Hodgins May is building on strong previous campaigns. In Higgins, where Sonia Simmons needs only a 2.6% shift in the vote to win. Or even Kuyong, where Piers Mitchum is trying to knock off the Treasurer, who's facing a climate revolt in his own backyard. Cooper and Wills also have strong campaigns, setting us up well, if not for this time, then certainly for next time. And it is great to see Tim Hollow and his team here today, who are leading a fantastic campaign in Canberra. Even, even if Labor does pull off a once in a 20 year swing and wins majority government in the lower house, the Greens will hold the balance of power in the Senate, potentially in our own right. We are on track to hold on to the three senators who are up for re-election, Lydia Thorpe, Dorinda Cox and Peter Wish Wilson, and add three more in Queensland, South Australia and New South Wales. If voters support us, we'll all be joined by Penny Orman Payne, a teacher from Gladstone who's fought for all teachers in the Queensland Teachers Union. Queenslanders have a clear choice. It's Penny versus Pauline or Palmer. In South Australia, our lead Senate candidate is Barbara Pocock, an emeritus professor and economist who has specialised in gender and rights at work, and she would be a bold fighter for South Australia, keeping the bastards honest. And in New South Wales, David Shoebridge, former barrister, environmental and social activist, is seeking to represent the people of New South Wales, keeping out one nation. Also keep an eye on the election here in ACT, where one recent report suggested Chinara Goring Goring, who's here with us today, stands, stands a great chance of knocking off the conservative Liberal Senator Zed Seselja. This, this all puts us on track to be the biggest third party in the Senate ever, the biggest ever Greens party room and the most powerful third party force in the next parliament. We urgently need more Greens elected because we're not just facing a climate crisis, we're facing an inequality crisis. The cost of living crisis is an inequality crisis. Currently, the gap between rich and poor has never been wider. Many billionaires doubled their wealth during the pandemic. Clive Palmer is trying to buy himself a seat in Parliament, and Gina Reinhart owns 1.2% of the land in this country. Meanwhile, one in three big corporations pays no tax. When a nurse pays more tax than a multinational, something is seriously wrong. Liberal and Labor have designed a system which gives big corporations and billionaires too much power, increases the cost of everything, and drives down wages. For working people and families, living standards are going backwards. Our essential services have been sold off and now electricity, housing, health and education are all too expensive. Over three million people are living in poverty. And in a heartbreaking move to the right, Labor has just agreed with the Liberals to keep people in poverty, refusing to lift income support payments above the poverty line. 400,000 women over the age of 45 are at risk of becoming homeless. 
And no matter how much money young people save, they will never be able to afford a home of their own. We have record low wage growth, endemic wage theft, and out of control insecure work. The arts and entertainment industries and our universities were simply abandoned during the pandemic, left to fend for themselves while the government's mates made out like bandits. Australia needs a pay rise. We need to increase the minimum wage to 60% of median weekly earnings. We need to outlaw insecure work. But here's my point. Government is key to fixing the inequality crisis. But only if we make the billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax and then use that money to make people's lives better. But with Labor now backing the Liberals on tax cuts for billionaires, handouts for wealthy property investors with more than three homes, keeping people in poverty and giving subsidies to coal and gas, Australia's social democracy is at stake. When Labor says that if they win the next election, an aged care worker will pay the same tax rate as a CEO, that's a trickle-down nightmare, and it's the end of Australia's progressive taxation system. And this is more than Labor running a so-called small target strategy designed to win one election. This is about the future of social democracy. With Labor siding with the Liberals to rip $184 billion out of the public purse to fund tax cuts for the wealthy, $69 billion in handouts to push up housing costs, and $98 billion for coal and gas subsidies, social democracy is headed for the chopping block unless more Greens are elected. Without Greens in balance of power to push the big corporations and billionaires to pay their fair share of tax, the next budget will be an austerity budget, and Australia will take one step closer to US-style inequality. Governments can do a lot. As we've just seen last week, with a stroke of a pen, ministers could remove all refugees from criminal detention. With the stroke of a pen, we could end the subsidies for coal and gas corporations and put a moratorium on all new projects. Governments can raise taxes on billionaires, they can improve services, they can cut off the handouts to coal and gas and ensure that everyone has an affordable home. Governments have the power to improve our country, but they've just sold us out given up, thrown in the towel, and they're hitting the snooze button on our future. Well, time's up. Young people have woken up to the fix. People deserve better. As I've said, our priority is to take climate action by stopping new coal and gas mines. But we'll tackle the cost of living too with three key demands. Get dental and mental health into Medicare. Fix the housing affordability crisis by building a million new homes that people can buy for $300,000 or rent for 25% of their income, and wipe student debt, which will relieve a huge burden for people at a time that many are trying to start a family or buy their first house. And today I can announce the details of our last <clears throat> as yet unreleased plank in this platform, something that will be at the top of our list, getting dental into Medicare. In, in 2010, when I won the seat of Melbourne for, first, for the first time, the Greens were in balance of power in both the House and the Senate, and my vote put Labor into government. We secured free dental care for kids. It survived the Liberals, and now kids can access $1,000 every two years in free dental services. If you haven't taken advantage of it yet, do it. The Greens want to finish the job and get dental into Medicare for everyone. You don't tackle the cost of living with one-off handouts that get eaten up by inflation, you do it by making structural changes, like getting dental care into Medicare. Toothaches are incredibly painful. Left untreated, tooth decay can kill you. Each year, over two million Australians avoid going to the dentist because they can't afford it. If you can't afford to see a dentist when you need to, the problems just get worse. People who avoid going to the dentist then face higher costs, increased risk of heart disease, and they can face social isolation. It's a social justice issue as well as being a health issue. And during the last two years, when so many people have been struggling to cope with the rising costs of living, one of the things people overlooked was their dental health. The lower your income and the further you live from a major city, the less likely you are uh, to be able to see a dentist. Low income earners have twice the rate of untreated dental decay and more than a third of people in remote and regional areas suffer untreated dental decay. 
and over half of all First Nations people live with untreated dental health issues. Poverty charges interest. If you can't afford to see a dentist today, you have to pay for a root canal tomorrow. Untreated dental conditions are one of the most significant causes of preventable hospital admissions. When people are unable to go to the dentist, they present in emergency departments, putting greater pressure on our hospitals. During the pandemic, we have come to truly appreciate the importance of investing in public health. We know that prevention is better than any cure. Dental care must be universal. It is a human right. Under our plan, everyone entitled to Medicare will be able to get bulk billed or rebated dental care, including oral surgeries and orthodontic treatment. The Greens want you to be able to use your Medicare card to go to the dentist. <laughs> Under the Greens plan, you can go to the dentist of your choice and use your Medicare card, just like at the GP. Our policy will cost $77.6 billion over the decade, about $8 billion a year, funded by making billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax, and it will make people's lives better. The money is there to pay for these big plans if we have the guts to take on the billionaires and the big corporations. Labor agrees with the Liberals that workers on low incomes should get one-off payment of $420, but billionaires should get a tax cut of $9,000 per year, every year, forever. The Greens want something different. The Greens will introduce a billionaire's tax which will tax the growing list of 131 billionaires in Australia, 6% of their wealth every year. We will introduce a corporate super profits tax or a tycoon tax, which will get the one in three corporations that currently don't pay any tax at all and force them to hand over their excessive profits on anything they make over $100 million. And we will crack down on multinational tax avoidance. We will also end the billions in subsidies to fossil fuel industries, which are not only trying to kill us, they're sending us an invoice. The Greens will make Clive Palmer pay more tax so that you can fix your teeth. So over the coming weeks, just like in the last two years, you will hear from us over and over a simple message. In balance of power, the Greens will kick the Liberals out and take climate action by stopping new coal and gas mines, and tackle the cost of living by getting dental and mental health into Medicare, fixing the housing affordability crisis, and wiping student debt. The election is still weeks away, but it can't come soon enough. People are sick of this Prime Minister. He promised to manage the economy and keep people safe, but he failed. It's just been one stuff up after another. But while people want to get rid of this government, the Greens included, Labor is sadly agreeing with the Liberals on too many issues that matter, like tax cuts for the wealthy and opening more coal and gas mines. I am sure Anthony Albanese will be, a, will be better than the current Prime Minister. But what people need is someone to keep Labor on track. For the last 50 years, the Greens have been fighting for the future. Since we fought to save the wild rivers of Tasmania, We've grown to be now the third biggest party in Australia. We've been elected to parliament in every state in the country. We've been in shared power governments in Tasmania and the ACT. Here in the ACT, for the last 10 years, we've been part of the progressive, stable and effective Greens Labor government, securing many important reforms, including 100% renewable energy, funding for affordable housing and an anti-corruption commission. One and a half million people vote for the Australian Greens. Our voters want change. They want justice. They want real social democracy, not sellouts and shills for coal and gas corporations. We represent the thousands of young people who took to the streets in the school strikes for climate. We're the voices of the people who want to protect the environment, make it sustainable for us all. And we have better policies for working people than the Labor Party and continue to attract support amongst the progressive union movement. And now we are fighting for the future. This election, people need to vote like their life depends on it. The climate crisis is spiralling out of control. It's now or never. The Greens will fight to protect this country by stopping new coal and gas mines. The Greens will fight to ensure that everyone has an affordable home, wipe student debt and dental and mental health as part of Medicare. 
The Greens will fight to make the big corporations and billionaires pay their fair share of tax. We will fight, we will grow, and we will win. So this election, vote like your life depends on it. Fight for your future, for a future for all of us. Vote climate, vote Greens. <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, we we're at war on climate. But you seem to have pared back uh, your message on climate to stopping new ca uh, coal and gas mines. Um, but you did also talk about winding back subsidies and things. Is it the case that that's the only thing you're pledging for this election in the climate change space, to clarify that for our audience? Is that enough? And is the fact that you're appearing to do that a sign of how jaded and complicated that climate change debate has become? No, we will go to the election with a science-based platform to tackle the climate crisis. We want emissions cut 75% by 2030, consistent with the science, and uh, net zero by 2035. We need a plan to get out of coal uh, in the next 10 years. We've got a plan to support workers during the course of that transition. And we've also got a plan to um, grow jobs around the country as we expand Snowy Hydro and turn it into a big build of renewable energy that is going to see us replace the equivalent of the current uh, coal fleet in the country with a new 25 gigawatt build of renewable energy over the next 10 years, which is going to turbocharge jobs and set Australia on the path to becoming a uh, renewable energy superpower, an exporter of energy, not just 100% uh, renewable energy, but 700%, where we sell our sun and our wind to the rest of the world. Uh, so we will, we will have that um, as part of our platform and we'll continue to push it. But one thing I think we can get agreement across almost all of the population on is that whatever else happens, we should not be opening new coal and gas mines. Like in the next parliament, while we work together to pass climate laws that are, we hope are consistent with the science, unlike Liberal and Labor's offerings, and work through how we're going to support coal and gas workers during the transition, one thing that everyone should be able to agree on across the political spectrum is don't open more coal and gas mines. And so one of the things that uh, concerns us this election is that the other parties all say, oh yeah, they take climate change seriously, but what they're not telling the Australian people is that all of their targets, none of their targets factor in the fact that they're going to open the Beetaloo Basin. That's not in Labor or, Labor or Liberals' plans. They're not telling people that at the same time, on the one hand, as they're saying, we want, to we want to tackle the climate crisis, that they actually now want to open up 114 new coal and gas projects. And that, for us, like one of the biggest differences um, that Australia could make to the global fight against the climate, as the world's third largest exporter of fossil fuel pollution and the world's biggest exporter of coal, one of the biggest differences that we could make is to stop opening new coal and gas mines. So we're putting it on the table because we think it will be um, a big boost to tackling climate action. It's achievable, it's popular amongst the Australian people, and the rest of the world would thank us for it because it would give uh, amazing momentum to the next climate summit if Australia went to the next climate summit and said we're not opening new coal and gas mines. Just, just to clarify that though, uh, if, you're in, if you are in a balance of power position in both, both chambers and you're negotiating uh, to give support to um, one of the major parties, would that suite of policies be part of your negotiating position or would it just be about the question of opening new coal mines? And Look, mines? we firstly want the Liberals out, so um, uh, Scott Morrison's got to go. Um, if we're in that position, and we're certainly going to be in balance of power in the Senate. We do have a comprehensive plan and a comprehensive policy platform that includes those issues that I just mentioned. Um, but what we've been clear 
uh, you know, during the course of the election campaign so that people have a clear understanding about what our priorities are. Our priorities are stop opening coal and gas mines, dental and mental health into Medicare, fix the housing affordability crisis and wipe student debt. They're the things that would be at the top of the list. Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Australian Financial Review and Vice President here at the Press Club. Um, Mr Baird, the uh, issue of preferences always comes up at election. I was just wondering if you can give us your thoughts on, on where negotiations are at with, with Labor on preferences. Will it be a national preference agreement? Will it be a seat-by-seat -seat arrangement, as, as sometimes happens? Um, and, and will that be in return um, for, for Labor's number two preference on um, the Senate ticket, how to vote ticket cards? And how are you approaching preferences with the, 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 the teal independents? For example, the, the Greens candidate and North Sydney, for instance, on their how to vote card, will they have like Kylie Tinker's their number two? Um, what, are, what are the sort of the, the arrangements being put in place with that organi those organisations? Yeah, so I through a few things. One is that it's actually voters that determine their preferences, so always important yes, you to remember. The hand of outcodes. Uh, no, no, I understand, but it's important to remember there's often a lot of confusion around preferences. People think political parties direct preferences. They don't. Um, voters decide that. So first thing is to know people. You can put your preferences wherever you like. Um, all that political parties can do is give you a recommendation in the form of a how to vote card. You get to decide where your preferences go and you should put them where, um, where you like. Secondly, within uh, our party, the way that it works is that it's not the members of parliament, it's the party itself that will be responsible for any discussions around preferences. And, um, there are some very good reasons for that, and that's what we'll do. So that's probably a question you're going to have to direct to the party when we know who, uh, who is in the race. Yes, lastly, we've made it very clear that um, we want to see the Liberals gone, so don't expect to see them on a very high position on the how to vote cards. But, but where, where, where will you... I, get, I appreciate you say it's for the party organisation, but what, what is the, the, the current thinking, your personal view as party leader, you know, it carries a... a, a got a sway. I mean, Labor number two and all the Greens how to vote cards, is that... Look, it'll, it'll ultimately be up to um, the party to make those recommendations, and one of the things about our party is that the local branches have a lot of say and a lot of autonomy, um, and so they, it may well be that it's the local branches that are making those final decisions. I would say to people, vote one Greens, um, and then put your preferences so that we kick the government out. Anna Henderson. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. You've, your party's vocally opposed the AUKUS submarine spending. We have reports today that Japan may well in some form be joining the AUKUS alliance. Given the changing international environment, are you reconsidering how strong your position is against this? And what do you make of Tokyo potentially coming on board? We need a defence policy that keeps Australia safe, but is based on Australia's interests. And what concerns us is that successive governments, including under Peter Dutton, are contracting out Australia's defence policy to other countries, and in this case, the United States. You mentioned the submarines. I mean, the purchase of these floating Chernobyls, um, which will come in a couple of decades, if at all, is designed to have submarines that can travel much further outside Australian waters than the current submarines can. Now, now, why is that, other than a switch from being about Australia's self-defence to being offence and being an arm of a, another country, the United States, offensive capabilities? So what we are really concerned about is that Australia, instead of trying to de-escalate tensions in the region, uh, is actively taking steps to escalate them. Now, Australia, so you ask about other countries in Australia's role. Australia as a country with relationships with both the United States and China is in a really good position in the region to be playing a role to de-escalate tensions because a conflict between the United States and China would be devastating for Australia, especially if it's a nuclear fueled conflict. We should be doing everything we can to keep people safe by de-escalating tensions, that is a big contribution that we could make as a middle power that's respected in the regions. And instead, instead we are contracting out our defence policy to another country 
and decisions are not being made in the interests of what is going to keep Australia safe. And just on Japan, sorry. Well, the, uh, again, I make the point that the, what Australia should be part of is multilateral efforts to de-escalate tension, not multilateral efforts to escalate tension. David Coe. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, uh, Mr Vant, for your speech. David Crowe from The Age of Melbourne and from the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, transgender issues came up the other day because the Prime Minister was asked about this. He, he backed in the Warringah Liberal candidate's position uh, on women in sport, transgender issues. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of Scott Morrison on that. Uh, I'd be interested in your view on that issue, but I'm also interested in whether on that question, it's, it's really it's a, it's about the fact that there's a strong opposition to Catherine Deves proposing a change to the law, or whether there's even a necessary change to the law. But across your policy platform, do you, do you think that there is any need to any change of the law on transgender issues in Australia at the moment? Do you suggest any change to the law, or is the law fine as it stands? Look, Scott Morrison said he was proposing those or backing those changes because he was concerned about women. I mean, give me a break. Like Scott Morrison, who has routinely turned his back on women who have come forward with some of the most serious allegations, and he's refused to investigate and then refused to tell the parliament what is going on, and he's turned a blind eye to uh, activities by his ministers and refused to lift the minimum wage in a way that would help women and left domestic violence services struggling to meet their funding, now says he pretends to care about women, give me a break. What this is about, from Scott Morrison, is an attempt to start up a devastating culture war that has the potential to claim lives. And I've seen this before. When conservatives are behind in the polls, they punch down and they try and pick groups who are deserving of our support and need, in need of our attention and in need of a sensitive debate about how best to support those groups. Instead, he tries to weaponise it and turn it into a culture war. I will not be joining the Prime Minister uh, in trying to prosecute a culture war when lives are at stake. Amongst young transgender people, nearly half of them have reported attempted suicide. We should be having a debate if we're having a debate at all in this country about how to support them, but trans rights are non-negotiable for the Greens, and that is crystal clear. And as to your question about what, uh, what changes there uh, could be made, there is a, a need in this country to include gender-affirming surgery in Medicare. That is one thing that would make a big difference. But at this moment, can I say this? Having lived through the marriage equality debate, where people reported back to me that what they felt like and what they heard was their very right to exist being debated in Parliament. We cannot afford another one of those. We cannot afford another one of those. People's right to exist should not be the fodder of political election campaigns. Trans people deserve our support. Sarah Ison. Sarah Ison from The Australian. Thanks, Adam, for the speech. Um, I would just like to ask about The Voice. Uh, the Greens were the first party to support the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and it's deliberately ordered uh, call for The Voice first, then Treaty, then Truth telling. Uh, but I think you guys, you know, have treaty now and treaty is being first. I'm interested to know uh, if you're going to stick to that, if Labor will put a voice uh, referendum to Parliament in the first term. What are you guys going to do? Yes, yeah, so we support the statement from the heart. Its components are truth, treaty and voice. Um, the statement itself, it's, it's a good statement. It's worth reading the statement because uh, it lays out all of those and says those need to be key elements that are incorporated. Our view is that we need to tell the truth first. Like We need a process of truth-telling in this country because otherwise we're going to continue to repeat the mistakes and the violence of the past. And that's why we're taking to the election a platform for a, a truth and justice commission at a national level, similar to what is happening in Victoria, to allow that process of truth-telling to begin. Then, next in line is the uh, need to strike a treaty with our First Nations people, um, to a treaty of equals. Once we've done that, that will give the best chance of success for changes, including voice, uh, to, to pass. We don't want to see a change 
put up that is designed to increase First Nations rights fail. And we need to do the groundwork. We need to do the groundwork. And the groundwork starts by telling the truth and then having that truth and justice process. So what we would be urging all of the other parties is have a close read of the statement and understand that those other elements are critical as well. And if we really want success to happen, it's a mistake to do it in any other order. Like we need to look at, need to do it in that order where we tell the truth, uh, then strike a treaty, and that will put us in the best position for reform so like voice to succeed. So if Labor does the referendum first, would you be opposing that particular order of events? Well, I would hope that uh, in this parliament and also in the next parliament, as we are a party that has 20% First Nations women, um, with strong representation, strong connection for community, putting forward a view that is widely shared, that these are the things that matter and that we need to do first, I would hope we'd be in a position to be able to have that discussion with the next government, um, because those are critical reforms that would be supported by people across the country. And what we're committed to is doing it right, making sure that anything that gets put to a vote succeeds, and that is what we genuinely think is the best order to make it happen. Paul Carp. Thanks very much for the speech. Um, in 2016, you wrote a chapter in an edited book titled Making Progressive Government Happen, in which you argued if Labor won't deal with the Greens in a hung parliament, then all bets are off and the Greens should be, quote, unafraid of sending voters back to the polls. Uh, could I please ask, does your SCOMO has got to go line mean that you're no longer prepared to send Australians back to the polls? And if so, what leverage will you have over a Labor Party that has ruled out any deal with the Greens? We won't send people back to a second election. Uh, the, uh, we would urge everyone, if there's a uh, parliament where, there, where power is shared, to respect the uh, views of the Australian people. If the Australian people deliver a parliament where multiple voices are represented, and I think that is the case, um, we, we've got no interest in sending people back to a second election and we wouldn't do it. The, as to what uh, Labor's approach is, if Labor says that they will or they won't talk, that's a matter for them. Um, I understand what they're saying, I hear what they're saying, um, but uh, at the end of the day, if we have that, then we don't want to go back to a second election, and that will involve parties talking to each other. And I think that's what people want, and I think people would accept that, especially when we've got such big challenges like the climate crisis, like the housing affordability crisis to deal with. Um, that is the approach that people want us to take. And look, I think questions are going to be asked this election, uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, of independence, of others who are running about what they would do should we find ourselves in this situation. And one thing that is crystal clear, and this is part of the reason I've been outlining our plan, is that to get laws passed in this country, unless Labor and the Liberals agree, then the Greens will be critical, because the Greens will be in balance of power in the Senate. So we're just laying out very clearly for people to see beforehand, here are the things that we're going to be putting on the table if we find ourselves uh, in that situation. I would hope that after the election, if we do find ourselves in that situation, that um, that the will of the Australian people is respected. I don't want to see us go back to a second election. Dominic, Dominic Giannini. Um, Dominic Giannini from the Australian Associated Press. Um, the Greens have been criticised as being obstructionist in the Senate and during the last power sharing agreement, the Liberals have seized on, on your coalition with Labor. Given that Labor have ruled out some of the core policies which are tax increases, nuclear submarines for AUKUS, just building on what some of my colleagues have touched on, um, what would happen in that scenario in a hung parliament? And you mention a hung parliament a lot. Would you consider it a personal failure should you not hold the balance of power after the next election? Um, the, I think that uh, whatever happens, the Greens are going to be in balance of power in the Senate. Like the Greens will be in balance of power in the Senate, and the Greens will be key to what laws uh, get passed uh, in this country, and also in a position to stop bad laws from being passed, like we were when Tony Abbott was in power and wanted to put up the cost of going to see the doctor. It was the Greens who were key to knocking that off. Um, sorry, and what was the first part? Uh, first part of the question: What would you do should Labor push for the AUKUS submarine deal for? Um, no higher taxes. You mentioned you don't want to send Australians back to another uh, election. What would happen? Would the good become the enemy of the bad? Uh, the good become the enemy of the perfect, rather? <laughs> the, um, look, the, the, I, I've laid out what our priorities will be for um, 
uh, in the next parliament that we're going to fight for when we have balance of power in the Senate, potentially in the House as well. Like that is the composition of the House and the Senate is ultimately up to the Australian people. Um, but certainly in the Senate, uh, we are going to be in a very, very strong position. What happens in the House? Well, we'll wait and see. But I read with interest what all the commentators are saying um, that the insiders believe is uh, is the likely outcome. But the commentators also said Labor would win the 2019 election. So would you consider it a failure should you not hold the balance of power? Well, I guess I'm saying that we will be in a position to balance the power in the Senate. And um, whether it's... Uh, and this is critical. And I think it's worth just reflecting on what happens in the Senate. Uh, there is a very real prospect in the seat of Queensland, for example, in the state of Queensland, in the Senate seat in Queensland, that it'll be the Greens or Pauline Hanson and Clive Palmer who win. Right? In South Australia, potentially as well, where One Nation looks set to take a lower house seat in South Australia, Greens or, in the South Australian Parliament, Greens or One Nation, potentially, in the Senate. That will have very significant consequences for what the next government is able to get done. But the balance of power in the Senate uh, after this election will have significant influence on the next government's agenda, and it will either be the Greens or Pauline Hanson and Clive Palmer. Now, that is, um, so I would say, I would urge people, however you're going to vote in the lower house, vote Greens in the Senate, because otherwise Pauline Hanson potentially has the whip hand over the next parliament, whoever it is, over the next government. And that would be a handbrake on um, a lot of the reforms that we need to tackle the crises that we're facing. Bridget Rolson. Bridget Rolson, ABC News. Labor's access plans to increase job seeker, um, given the job market is a lot more competitive now, um, we're seeing record low in unemployment rates. Is it still vital that those payments are lifted again? In a wealthy country like ours, no one should be living in poverty. We need to lift income support payments above the poverty line so that people who have lost their job or who are single parents or pensioners can lead a decent life above the poverty line. Like during the course of the pandemic, all of a sudden, Scott Morrison realised that the rest of the country was about to find out just how terribly the government had been treating unemployed people. And so for a period of time, they lifted income assistance above the poverty line. And for people who had been looking for jobs and just struggling to survive, it meant that they could afford to go and buy medicines, get that haircut that might help them get that new job, do a bit of training. Like, it meant people could live a life where you didn't have to skip essentials. You cannot live on the current rate of job seeker without missing out on essentials like food and medicine. And for too many people who've been plunged into poverty, it is making not only their lives worse, but their health worse, and it is affecting their families and their children. We need to lift income support payments to $88 a day. We can afford it, and that is a key part of the Greens platform. Annabelle Hennessy. Hi, Annabelle Hennessy from the West Australian newspaper. Thank you for your address today. In the 2019 um, election, the convoy Bob Brown led to Townsville was blamed for costing Labor votes in Queensland. Um, the Greens almost also famously voted against the carbon pricing scheme 10 years ago with the Liberal government. What would you say to those who might feel that your party has actually been counterproductive to the climate change movement by not taking what some would consider a more pragmatic approach? And do you accept the fact that there are people who are employed in the um, coal, gas and mining industry who naturally are going to feel an economic anxiety about potential losses of their own jobs. Look, I've been to Western Australia, to Queensland, to New South Wales with a simple message. We need to support coal and gas workers through the transition. But just because we stop mining coal and gas doesn't mean we're going to stop mining. Right? The best job in many places for a coal worker is another mining job because we are blessed in Western Australia and in Queensland with so many of the minerals and metals that we're going to need to build batteries, uh, electric cars, uh, wind turbines, all of the things that we need in a zero pollution society. So we can grow jobs in mining, in processing, in minerals, but it's coal and gas that we need to get out of. People 
are looking at what's going on and they understand change is happening, but Liberal and Labor aren't telling them the truth. During elections, Liberal and Labor turn up in mining towns in high-vis vests and say, oh, look, everything's all right. We can keep mining coal and gas into the 2050s and meet our climate targets, but it is a lie. And workers know they are being lied to. And so our message to those workers, especially this time around, has been, we have got a plan to make sure that workers in the coal sector don't lose incomes, have their wages guaranteed for the next 10 years as we make the transition, and we'll support the businesses that will grow in these places to move people over. And that might include uh, someone in Western Australia going and working uh, on lithium rather than gas. Like, these opportunities are there. And on jobs, I would say, you know, what about the tens of thousands of jobs in Western Australia in farming, in wine, in tourism, that are dependent on a healthy environment? Like, what is going to happen to the Margaret River region and the southwest if all of it, when rainfall patterns permanently change and when bushfires become a regular feature? What happens to the tourism industry around this country and the 60,000 plus jobs in Queensland that are dependent on a healthy Great Barrier Reef if Labor and Liberals' targets are met and the reef is gone forever? Like, we have to defend jobs. And the way to defend jobs and to set all industries, including mining, up for the future is to make the switch and look after workers. But it starts by telling the truth. And at the moment, Liberal and Labor are refusing to do that. And as a result, what we're seeing in New South Wales is corporations saying, we're going to close this coal-fired power station earlier than expected, and there's no plan to support the workers in their communities. So I accept, I agree, I'm, it's no wonder that people are feeling anxious. It's because Liberal and Labor aren't telling them the truth. And they can see it. They can see that change is coming and people are looking for governments to step in and provide support. We've done industry transition in this country well before and we've done it terribly. And on the climate crisis, Liberal and Labor are doing it terribly because they're refusing to tell the truth. And that is going to hurt workers and communities and that's what the Greens are trying to stop. Harley Dennett. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Harley Dennett from the Canberra Times. Uh, the ACT Greens have twice formed government with, the, uh, with uh, formed a coalition with Labor to form government. Nobody has more experience negotiating with Labor than Shane Rattenbury, the leader of the ACT Greens. Have you spoken with him? Have you gotten any tips from him? <laughs> Labor doesn't seem particularly willing to come to the table, so do you have any ideas on that front? And if I could also ask, would you be disappointed if David Pocock beat your Greens candidate in the ACT Senate seat? The, um, look, in the Senate, I think we're in with a great chance of winning. It's always tougher in the ACT because there's two spots, compared, whereas uh, in other places there's more. Um, uh, I think there is a, if people vote one Greens for Gennaro Green Green in the Senate and then give their preferences <laughs> to um, someone else in, an, in a way that then puts the Liberals further down the ballot paper, then I think we're in for a good result on election night. Uh, as to Shane, um, yes, I do talk uh, regularly with Shane Rattenbury, and one of the things that I think um, that we try and tell the rest of the country is that ACT is a success story uh, in terms of what's been achieved. And switching over to 100% renewable and renewables, a plan to help households as we get off gas, and an integrity commission, all of these things are popular things. And um, uh, this is a point that I make too. Our agenda going into this election is an agenda that I think is supported by the majority of people in this country. Getting dental and mental health into Medicare, wiping student debt, making housing affordable and saying no new coal and gas projects, that is supported by the majority of people in this country. And I think what ACT shows us is that when you put Greens into Parliament, it is better for the people. But Anthony Albanese has not shown any willingness to talk to you. What are you going to do to bring him to the table? Well, that'll ultimately be up to um, the state of the parliament and the more Greens that are in parliament, in the House and in the Senate, the greater our power is going to be. And look, we, we've got an election at the moment that is rapidly just descending into this 
abject fact-checking exercise between a corrupt government and a visionless opposition, right? And we are putting new ideas on the table, and they are popular ideas that will gain people's support. And in the next parliament, if all the best Liberal and Labor can come up with is, oh, we're going to give tax cuts to billionaires and open new coal and gas mines, then we will be the ones representing the people in that parliament. And one of the things that I've learned from being in this gig for a while now is that there's no monopoly on good ideas and you put a good idea on the table. I was the first one in the House of Representatives to introduce an anti-corruption bill, an anti-corruption commission bill for a federal integrity commission, right? Um, we were the first ones to say we need marriage equality in this country. And they spend years and years telling you you're wrong and howling you down and then they turn around at the last minute and pretend the idea was theirs all along, right? And that is what is happening this election. We are the ones putting the ideas on the table, the ideas that are backed by the people of this country. And I think the next government, if we find ourselves in that situation where we can get some of our ideas up because we're in a strong position in the Senate or in the House, it's only going to increase the next government's vote. Because people like dental and mental health going into Medicare and people don't want new coal and gas mines open. So we're putting popular ideas on the table that I think the next government, when they sit down and take a look at them out of the heat of the election time frame, um, will think, oh yeah, that's actually pretty good. Ben Westcott. Hi, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thanks for the speech. Um, you've spoken a lot today about balance of power, getting more Greens in the Senate. Um, almost all elections since 2007 have had a major or at least a partial focus on climate change and the environment, which is a, something which is a pretty big issue for your party. But the Greens vote peaked in 2010 at just over 11 per cent and hasn't risen that far again. I mean, does this show that your party has failed to cut through with Australian voters on this, your most crucial issue? And is the failure to get any more of a vote a failure of your party's past leadership? Well, I want to, again, just take you back over the last few, few years and what has happened. We've doubled the number of MPs that we've got in the Queensland Parliament, right? We just had a record vote in South Australia, by, including by campaigning on climate. We've tripled the number of members of parliament that we've got here in the ACT. Our vote went up in Tasmania, the only party in parliament whose vote went up, even as independents and others entered the race. But, and what matters in many respects is what is the vote in the Senate and in the key places that we're running, and what is the vote looking like in the states and in the lower house, where we've got really strong lower house campaigns going. And I'd urge you to go and have a look at the recent breakdowns of the polls in Queensland and how well the Greens are doing in Queensland at the moment, because we are offering a real alternative. Because you see, the thing is, at the moment, as, as it seems to me, the opposition's campaign is basically the guy who's in charge is terrible, but we agree with him on effectively everything that matters. And so a lot of voters are looking at that saying, well, if that's right, I want something different. And we are putting on the table a plan that's based on making the billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax and doing things that make people's lives better and people are responding to it. So I guess come back and ask me that question again after the election um, because my job between now and then is to do everything I can to ensure that we get more Greens into Parliament. But at the moment, the recent history and the signs are looking good. Julie here. Thank you, Mr. Bant. Julie here from the Australian Financial Review, and I'm a director on the National Press Club. Um, so you talk about Liberal and Labor and, and I guess Clive Palmer having populist ideas just to, want, just to gain support. Um, however, I want to ask you about your higher education policy, which is to return to free university tuition and repaying all student debt, which according to your own press release currently, currently sits at 33 billion over the forward estimates and 100, um, 33 billion over 40 estimates, forward estimates and 60 billion over a decade. And that on top of that, there's $10 billion a year in Commonwealth grant scheme. I would suggest the problem with your policy is that it favours the wealthy middle classes who go to universities and will hit the tax paying working poor who will subsidise the 40% of middle class people who go to university. It's a myth that Whitlam's free education increased the number of disadvantaged and poor people who went to university. The fact is that John Dawkins and Bruce Chapman's hex 
um, was developed just to counter that and to broaden the sorts of people that went to university. I ask you, is this policy as cynical as Clive Palmer's capping mortgage interest rates at 3% just to attract the votes of middle class university students and graduates? And is that unfair and unrealistic? My dad was the first person in his family to go to university. <laughs> and, you know, it was uh, not a thing that someone who grew up in a working class household did. But he went because he could afford to go, because it did not cost. And that opportunity is increasingly being denied to people who look at having a huge debt that is going to be hanging around them at a time when they're trying to start a family or even buy a house. It is additional debt that people don't need to carry. What makes society fairer is you have university education, TAFE, schools being genuinely free so that everyone can go and do it. And if as a result of that, you have the good, for, good fortune to then be earning a million dollars a year, you pay a higher tax rate than someone who is on the minimum wage. You have a progressive taxation system and that's how you get the money back. And you say, oh, we'll make one in three big corporations who pays no tax, who get or who also get the benefit out of an educated population, they can start paying their fair share of tax as well. So fundamentally, the question is, do we think it's right to have a user pays model that saddles people with debt that's just going up and up and up and up at a time that they can't buy a house and wages are low? Or is it fairer to say everyone in this country has the right to go to university and will wipe student debt because that is a much better cost of living measure than six months of cheaper petrol that could get eaten up when the big petrol corporations put up their costs anyway? That, and then if you have the good fortune of earning a lot of money, you pay a higher rate of tax than a lower income earner. That is what a fair society looks like. Ron Meisen. Uh, G'day, Mr Bant. Ron Meisen from the Australian Financial Review. Thanks so much for your speech. Look, one of the lines that caught uh, my eye in your speech was this idea of the, uh, the corporate super profits tax. Uh, and you said here that it's uh, forcing companies to hand over their excessive profits on anything they make over $100 million. Um, looking at your policy document, it says that the tax would apply for non-mining corporations to those with $100 million in turnover. Uh, are you applying the 40% rate to those who are making profits over $100 million or those who with turnover over $100 million? And just very quickly, talking of abject fact-checking exercises, you said in the speech that uh, wages growth wasn't going uh, particularly well. What's the current WPI? Well... <laughs> Google it, mate. I mean, <laughs> like, I am, I am sick. If you want to know, if you want to know why people are turning off politics, it's because what happens when you have a, an election that increasingly becomes this basic fact-checking exercise between a government that deserves to be turfed out and an opposition that's got no vision. This is what happens. Like, elections should be about a contest of ideas. Politics should be about reaching for the stars and offering a better society. And instead, and instead, there's these questions that are asked about can you tell us this particular stat or can you tell us that particular stat? And those questions are designed to show that politicians are somehow out of touch and not representative of everyday people. Well, newsflash, most of the people in Canberra are on six-figure salaries just passing time until they go out and work for their coal and gas corporations and get a six- or seven-figure lobbying job. Do you know what would be a better way of showing... Do you know what would be a better way of showing that politicians are in touch with the need of everyday peoples, it would be passing laws that lift the minimum wage. It would be making dental and mental into Medicare. It would be making sure that we wipe student debt and build affordable houses. And when you've got wages growing at about two and a bit percent and inflation growing at about three and a half percent, that is part of the problem. And I would hope, I would hope that at this election, we can lift the standard and turn it into a genuine contest of ideas. Your profit tax. So, so I'll take that as a no, but on the profits tax question? Well, I answered your question about the wages. Yeah. On the profits, when you have big corporations with turnover over $100 million and they're making excessive profits, which we define 
as being um, allowing 5% to be an acceptable profit level. And we're saying take 5%, add it to the long-term bond rate, which is currently around about 1% or 2%. On those excessive profits above that, you tax their uh, profits at 40%. Again, it's in our policy. Just go and Google it and have a look at it. <laughs> Astrid Watts. Thank you, Laura. Hi, Adam. Um, so we all know the Greens have a very big history of supporting people with disabilities. What are you going to do and promise us in the next sitting of Parliament to change the accessibility issues that we are facing? And also, what are you going to do to change the fact that the Morrison government slid through a rule that allows the CEO of the NDIA to change participants' plans without A, having met them, and B, not notifying them until they're trying to apply for funding. Yeah, it's, look, thanks for the question. It's something that we're fighting for and is really close to our heart. And of course, we've got Jordan Steele John, the Senator from Western Australia, who's, um, uh, who is fighting for the rights for people with a disability. And the changes that have been brought about within the NDIS, we've strongly opposed. And uh, we, the changes, especially around independent assessment of plans, is something that needs to be rejected. We need to make sure the NDIS is fully funded. We need to make sure people have access to, which is starting to change, have access to the draft plans um, and not ha allow changes like the kind that you're talking about to be made without reference to the people who are involved. We want to change the IT infrastructure and the systems for they're involved in the NDIS so that they're more accessible to people who have disabilities. But on that broader question about accessibility, we've pushed for a $3 billion Accessible Australia Fund to allow local councils and state governments um, to be able to bid in and get money to ensure that we can start changing infrastructure to ensure that it's accessible for everyone. Um, and part of that is something I'm especially fond of and attached to is an accessible nature fund so that um, the, the outdoor activity that can often be, there can be barriers to people if they've got mobility related disabilities um, is something that everyone can enjoy. Thank you so much. So, um, so um, I'm going to take uh, presidential uh, liberties and just ask you the final question. Um, you talked about how both sides don't really want to address a lot of the big issues. One of the glaring ones is the difference between the forecast spending levels and revenue levels in the budget. About 26% uh, spending uh, in 10 years' time, less than 24% uh, for revenue. One of the things that's come out of the pandemic is the question of the role and size of government. Mm. Do you think there is a number you can nominate uh, for what revenue should be uh, in 10 years' time? Or more broadly, do we need to actually, over time, let uh, revenue rise to meet likely spending? Look, I, it, the question is where you're getting the revenue from and what are you spending it on? And I think that's got to be the first order questions. Um, the last, our last election platform, I think from memory, our um, revenue to GDP ratio was perhaps about 2% higher than the government's. And, um, that's still substantially below the OECD average and that of other Scandinavian countries. What we're putting on the table is a fair costed platform about where to get the revenue from and a, uh, what we think is a fair way of spending it. And I think fundamentally that ought to be the question and this, this argument that we should set these limits about percentage tax to GDP um, or revenue uh, or, or, or spending rather, uh, like spending measures, like putting an arbitrary spending cap on government for the sake of it without reference to what the money is being spent on is a recipe for austerity. And that's where this government, I think, wants to take us. I think better to have a discussion about what is the, um, uh, uh, who should pay and what are they going to spend it on. And I think, uh, and I hope that one of the things that's become clear from what I've said during my speech today in the platform that we're outlining is that we can make life better for people without asking everyday people to pay more tax. Like, we can make life better by taking on those one in three big corporations that pays no tax, um, taking on those billionaires that are making obscene wealth, and then using that money to make people's lives better. And that, I think, is a discussion that the people in this country are up for. 
please thank Ed and Ben. Authorised by Jamie Cole, Australian Greens, Canberra.